I actually wanted to add one more thing that I'm super proud of. And um, this year, I received a Lifetime Achievement Award because I'm actually, that was probably a little old because I'm in my 36th year <laughs> of being a respiratory therapist. But I got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the state of Colorado, uh, Respiratory Care Society. So I said, does this mean that I have to quit now? Or, you know, is it for me? I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So anyway. Um, Let's go through this. Sorry, I just need to get adjusted here. See what's going on. All right. We are going to be talking about um, health-related quality of life and how we as respiratory therapists can make a difference in our patients' lives. <clears throat> I do have some disclosures. I do own a set respiratory care in Inglewood, Colorado, and I will be talking about some of my policies and procedures. Um, just because that's near and dear to my heart and how we take care of our patients brings quality of life to, their, um, to them. I also am on the clinical advisory board for Brayos. They are a ventilator manufacturer. They are actually over in the other room. You should go see it. It's very good vent. Um, I'm also the chair of the HMERT Council for the American Association of Home Care and a board member for the American Association of Home Care. And the reason why I bring that up is because I'm so passionate about what we do in home care. Even though I've done acute care, um, I was at Craig Hospital and did care at Craig Hospital with spinal cord and brain injury, pa injured patients. Really, um, home care is, is uh, almost like the orphan, used to be the orphan. Nobody wanted to be in home care that was a skilled, quality respiratory therapist because they thought people would think bad of them. Um, so I wanted to mention that as well because I will talk a little bit about what we're doing, um, some legislative efforts to help quality of life for our patients in the home. All right, this is what our objectives are today. I'm not gonna read them, because you can. Sorry, I gotta figure this out here. I'm sorry, I popped it right forward. All right, let's see if I can get my information to move on. All right then, so when I started in respiratory school, over 35 years ago, we did not talk about anything about quality of life, let alone health-related quality of life, even though the World Health Organization in 1948 put out a statement about quality of life and how it is a, uh, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. Did anybody else talk about quality of life? Who here has taught, learned about quality of life? Oh, excellent. There are some. Fabulous. Um, so in 1993, the United States really ramped up their surveys for quality of life. They had two primary goals. They wanted to direct and administer the development of national, state, and local um, surveillance for health-related quality of life, and then they would develop, validate, and refine those surveys for health-related ah, health quality of life measures for use for tracking and also prevention research for every stage of a person's life. So when they were looking at quality of life, they looked at what does that really mean? And they came up with quality of life is a broad, multi-dimensional concept that usually includes subjective evaluations of both positive and negative aspects of life. 
but really quality of life means something different for everyone here. And even if we're in a different um, avenue of the medical field, it means something different as well. So all these different public health community um, aspects looks at, sorry, lost my place here, looks at different measures. So you might be a sociologist, you might be a psychologist, you could be a social worker, you could be someone that works with the aging and the disabled, even environmental, um, sustainability, economics, marketing, urban and rural development. All of those people want to know about health-related quality of life. In 2010, the um, CDC and HHS started a um, survey, and they called it Healthy People 2020. And they su surveyed groups of people over a decade. And then they just most recently started Healthy People 2030. And they look at different disease processes. Like in 2030, um, they're looking at uh, asthma, breast cancer, diabetes, and they find people in, with those disease processes and follow them over the 10 years. So you can look that up. It's Healthy People 2020 and 2030. Then what they do is develop their um, different um, processes for public health around that. Each person, as I was saying, has a different quality of life standard. Mine is going to be different than anyone else's here, and yours is the same. It's going to be different. Also, what we consider a quality of life can be different. Just like when we talk about bareback riding. OK? That means something different, I found out when I came here. That's bareback riding, too. <laughs> So what is health-related re quality of life? The CDC says it's an individual or group's perceived physical and mental health over time. That's the key. We want to look at it in stages of life. It's our well-being. It's what's meaningful to us. It's what makes us happy. It, do we have a good life? Do we have... Uh, a way to have um, make a living? Do we live in a good environment? Do we have a space that we can go out and go for a walk to help keep us healthy? Do we have uh, relationships that are stable and enjoyable? And do we feel positive about ourselves? And do we feel like we're reaching our own maximum potential? So why are we wanting to measure that? Again, it's for tracking purposes to make sure that we are building our public health policies around what is needed. It also looks at the burdens of preventable disease, injuries, and disabilities, and it can provide valuable insights into relationships between health-related quality of life and risk factors. So things such as people's BMI, their um, physical inactivity, their smoking status, is their secondhand smoke when they're looking at the asthma programs. They want to know what are those factors as well and how can they decrease the risk to the population. So really over time, we have learned that we should not just be looking at health-related quality of life as how did we save someone's life, but how are we going to make it better? So no matter if you're in an acute care situation, 
an LTAC, uh, skilled nursing facility, or home care. As a respiratory therapist, we should be thinking about that. How is what we are doing going to improve their lives once they get to the next point of care? We really have not even looked at um, um, home mechanical ventilation, whether invasive or non-invasive, as part of uh, health-related quality of life standards until about 20 years ago. And how long have we had people at home with home mechanical ventilation? I know I was participating in that in the 1990s, and I know even before that, um, there was the very first person that was recorded was in the 1950s who went home with an iron lung um, because of polio. So it's been around for a long time. We just never looked at it. Sorry, I'm a little discombobulated. This is different than my computer and I'm looking for things and I apologize for that because it looks silly. <laughs> Okay, so how do we measure it? Um, I'm going to hone in just specifically on respiratory diseases, um, but there's all kinds of other ways to measure for health-related quality of life. So if we look at chronic respiratory disease questionnaire, and again, this, these are surveys that they do that then they compilate all the information um, and publish those. This is a very common um, used measurement, and they look at people with chronic respiratory disease, as it is stated in the um, title. They look at four different categories. They look at dyspnea. They look at fatigue, emotional functioning, and also something they call mastery, which is a feeling of control over the disease. Then they came along with St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, and that was developed in the 1980s by Paul W. Jones at St. George University in London. And it too is disease specific. That's designed to measure the impact of the overall health um, on daily life and perceived well-being in patients with obstructive airway disease. There's 50 different um, categories that they look at, and they divide them up into two parts. One is the system component. They ask about the frequency and severity of system, of, uh, excuse me, symptoms. Um, they do surveys in one, three, and 12 months, and then they divide it up into the second part, which are um, activities that cause or are limited by breathlessness. So again, they're looking at the impact of functions such as the social functioning, um, psychological disturbances, and this is all resulting from their obstructive airway disease. It's measured on a four-point Likert scale, and they score it from zero to 100. The higher the score, the more the limitations kind of like a ventilator on these things. Then they're gonna swap it around on us here. Um, then we're going to look at the severe respiratory insufficiency questionnaire. I'm gonna show you a study that was uh, recently published that uses the severe uh, respiratory insufficiency scale. And that too looks at patients with chronic respiratory failure that um, are using mechanical ventilation and or oxygen long term. Again, it's looking at their, the impact of the quality of life. This has actually um, been around since 2003. Um, it is a well-validated study uh, tool to use. Um, it originated in Germany. It has seven different categories that it looks at with 49 different components that it asks. So it's gonna ask patients about respiratory complaints, physical functioning, attendance syndromes and sleep, 
social relationships, anxiety, um, their psychological well-being, as well as social functioning. Their subjects are asked to look at the previous two weeks to the survey and say, how did you feel about those different 50 questions? Oh my gosh. It takes a long time to answer that for people. They need to shorten it. <laughs> um, it has a scale of 0 to 100. And this one, though, says the higher the score, the better the health-related quality of life. So let's look at the study that was done out of Norway um, from Oslo University. Um, it was published in November of 2022 in uh, Respiration, which is a journal, uh, European journal. Um, they decided they should look into non-invasive ventilation because in 2007, only 20 of every 100,000 people actually used non-invasive ventilation. That was in 2027, or excuse me, 20, 2007. And in 2019, it had rose to every, out of every 100,000 people, 51 people just like here in the United States, we're using it more, but the technology is there, right? That's why we use it. And um, as Dr. Hess said yesterday, it actually works. We found out it works, right? From all the studies that have been done. <clears throat> so again, their objective was to find out with these people that are on non-invasive ventilation, what is the impact on their health-related quality of life. They actually interviewed 97 people, ended up with 67 people that they um, brought into the study, and only 62 completed the survey. That's why I said these surveys are awfully long. We still need to refine them and actually make them shorter. Um, just like with some of our therapies that we give, they aren't compliant unless it's easy, right? And they can do it the same way every time. And a lot of times, even with nebulizer treatments, they don't want to do it because it takes too long, right? So same thing with asking them to participate in this study. All of the patients that they looked at were um, given nocturnal oximetry. They did ABGs, polysomnography and nocturnal transcutaneous CO2 measurements. Of those 62 people who completed the survey, they rated their overall health-related quality of life when using non-invasive ventilation at a 64.8, so almost a 65. That's a pretty good score for a health-related quality of life. Um, they also determined that patients, if you can see there the patients with um, central hypoventilation syndrome and those with restrictive thoracic disorders were the ones that had the highest scores. People with obesity hypoventilation had the lowest scores for health quality of life <clears throat> overall. Then they went on to look at those respiratory events that were associated with health-related quality of life. Everyone had to be compliant for three months or more. They saw that um, the medium hours of usage for non-invasive ventilation was about eight hours a day. 85% of the um, people in the study actually used their device for greater than four hours per day. Um, they noted, I guess I can have that, but I can't see it from here. So you're just gonna have to believe me. <laughs> it is up there. Um, they found that uh, respiratory complaints um, were, uh, as far as attendant symptoms with sleep, were um, high for the, in the category of people who had abnormal uh, saturation levels or their ODI 4% that was um, less than 90% saturation. They found a high score for that 
and actually it's a low score. My apologies, but it means that they had um, a worse quality of life in that category. And then they also looked at respiratory complaints and anxiety. The anxiety for people whose PCO2s were, um, and CO2s were over 45. Now this was done in Europe, so they're using a different measurement, house bells. So um, that is actually 45. The sickness is a 45 here um, in millimeters of mercury. Um, so they surmised that the more that someone had a respiratory event, the lower overall score that their um, health-related quality of life was. Not rocket science, right? Or respiratory science. You can read that. Then they went on to look at AHI and patient ventilator um, asynchrony. And they said the more they had um, abnormalities for both AHI and for patient ventilator asynchrony, the um, lower their scores were, the worse their health-related quality of life was. They concluded that long-term ventilation overall was a positive for health-related quality of life. However, the more they had respiratory symptoms, such as hypoxemia, desaturations, daytime and nocturnal hypercapnia, um, AHI, uh, increased AHI, and also increase in their patient ventilator asynchrony, um, was a negative impact on these patients. And they suggested that there, there should be another study that they do that looks at the association between um, those uh, uh, respiratory events and the decrease in health-related quality of life, and then also do a prospective interventional study as well so that we can design to see if it really confirms that it is, um, if we can get them to have lower AHI, if we can um, have them more synchronous with the ventilator. These all really make sense to me, do they not to you? I mean, if you got somebody that doesn't want to use the ventilator because they're not in sync, I always say make the ventilator work for you when I'm setting up a ventilator for, on a patient. And you know we go through all the systems and we look, is there a leak? If there's a big leak, they're going to have lots of asynchrony. So let's make sure we've got the right interface, whatever that may be. Let's make sure that we're correcting these so that we can have a patient that has a better health-related quality of life. They can go and do things because they feel better, right? All right. Now, I really had to think about this one. This one was a study that was done in Canada in 2002 but I think it's, it, to me it was, where have we been and now where are we? How did we improve things? Whether it was intentional or non-intentional, whether someone looked at this study from Canada and said, oh, I'm going to make some differences in ventilation. So let's take a look at it here. It was an open-ended study. It was an interview with about 104 patients from the age of 21 to 75. They had to be on ventilation for at least two years. Um, this was a 145 page study because it was an open-end question. They would ask them a question and then they would respond and um, they were looking at their health-related quality of life from their perspective when they're on a ventilator. They maybe lived at home, 
they may have lived in a facility. But they also had to be on ventilation for a minimum of two years. Um, they wanted to look at what was their relationship between their significant disability and using home mechanical ventilation and then the impact on their health-related quality of life. What was their perception over time? So they went and started with people, again, they were, um, had to be at least five years on the ventilator. So they started there and then they looked at them two years later and asked the same questions so that they could find out how did that impact their life and how did they perceive it over time. Because we could have made some changes to help them, right? So they asked them about the introduction and the adjustment to mechanical ventilation. What about the impact on their daily lives? How did it support them? What, was, what were the barriers? What was the satisfaction? What were they dissatisfied about? And how can we as an industry, a medical industry, make improvements? And what was their advice? So they said, number one, on the introduction and adjustment, tell me about my disease and why do I have to be on ventilation? And do I have to have a tracheostomy? And this was 2002. so. NIV was not real popular at that time, or is there something else that I can do, like maybe negative pressure? That was actually being used in 2002, not as much as um, mechanical ventilation, because they wanted to you know, poke a hole in people, give them a trach, right? Isn't that what we used to do? So they said, tell me about it sooner than later. It makes my decision making better. Um, how can I be proactive about all the challenges that I'm going to uh, face if I don't have good information? They also said I need to be educated on ventilation. Those people who take care of me need to be educated on ventilation. They said it's a really steep learning curve. No kidding, right? <laughs> I tell these people we try to give them the education we got in years in a matter of weeks. Of course it's a steep learning curve. Um, they said that they needed for their daily life, it improved their energy. It made them more comfortable. They had felt like it's better health benefits. That were, those were the positives. However, it is challenging and they felt like they were a little bit out of control of their own health. Some of these patients even weaned themselves down from 24-7 ventilation. Who here works in the home environment? They do what they want, right? Well, some of these patients actually weaned themselves off of the ventilation using glossopharyngeal or frog breathing, maybe just for a couple hours at a time, but they got off that ventilator. They needed the freedom from it. They also said that they um, did feel, again, it was a positive in their life. It was a necessary part of their life. It actually gave their life meaning, but there were barriers. The barriers happened to be the size of the ventilator. Think back, 2002, how big were our home ventilators? I used to say that in the 90s that that was my workout session when I would go visit with my vent patients because you always had to pull that vent out. It weighed about 35 pounds, right? Pull that vent out, look at it, put it back. Oh, we got two of them. Okay, if that's on the chair or if it's somewhere else, you got to pull it out, look at it. Okay. 35 pounds, right? This gentleman right here is like shaking his head. Yes, they weighed 35 pounds and then the battery on top of that. Um, so yeah, it was a bulky size. They said it's intrusive sound was terrible, especially suction machines. And then they said houses aren't suited for their kind of disability, nor is the community. Lack of computer access, 2002, all right? 
What were they most satisfied about? Their family and friends support. And they can also be an advocate for people on ventilation and um, be able to participate to improve things. What were their suggestions and said what needs to be improved? Number one, healthcare system overall. Number two was income opportunities and security. Number three was accessibility. And number four was device technology. They just didn't think we quite had it. No, I don't think we quite had it down either. So what have we done to improve their lives? Well, what did I just say? Number one thing we don't do all the time that we used to do all the time. If you're going to be on a ventilator at home, what did we do? Poke a hole in them, stick a trach in them. Who has ventilator patients right now that has never had a trach, will never have a trach, right? Good stuff. We can do good things with non-invasive ventilation. Phonation, important. I know the gentleman over there from Passy Muir. Um, phonation is important to communicate. Can you imagine, I can't imagine, if somebody told me I can't talk anymore. And if you did talk, you can just lip the words. And how frustrating that is. I used to be a pretty good lip reader working at Craig Hospital because all of our patients were traked and vented or 90% of them, so they couldn't tell you what they needed. They could only, you had to be a good lip reader. When you weren't, it was very frustrating. How about um, eye gazers? Well, what's the problem with that? They're very expensive, right? However, the community, there are grants that they can get. That also came from health-related quality of life studies. Airway clearance devices, not just suction machines anymore, right? Um, and accelerators. I'm going to just put a pitch out there. We're having a hard time getting them. Everybody should be contacting their senators <laughs> and their congresspeople and tell them it's difficult. And so we need to, my recommendation would be an emergency use authorization for the ones from Europe to bring them over so it, that we have um, airway device clearance or anticephalators actually. We also have vest therapy. It doesn't work for everybody, just like uh, an anticephalator isn't for everybody. Uh, nutrition, we have to make sure that we're feeding them so that they can have a good quality of life, so that they have energy. And it doesn't matter how they're feeding. Is it um, by mouth or are they um, needing a G-tube? Let's make sure they have good quality food. Mobility, because not everybody who's on a ventilator lays around at their house, right? We have people that go to Europe. We have people that go take their babies to Disneyland and Disney World and on cruises. We got to make sure that we're giving them the opportunity to do those things. Also, liberation from the ventilator or weaning, whether it's just a few hours a day, it gives them a more positive sense that they're um, in control of their own disease. And then in palliative care, we don't really think a lot about that. That's another thing that we don't talk about. Hospice and palliative care, when we're um, learning, we probably learned it after we got out of school, correct? So palliative care is an important part. It's comfort care. It um, should be started pretty much right away after someone has been um, diagnosed with a disease or a syndrome um, that is progressive or can make a huge impact on their health. Because we can actually use palliative care to not only help people with their medical needs, but also social, emotional, practical support. We can work with their physicians. And then there's also a team of palliative care specialists 
doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, uh, social workers, nutritionists, chaplains, and I'm going to throw in respiratory therapists because we work with our companies that support our patients with palliative care and even hospice. But palliative care is different than hospice, and that's a whole other lecture. All right, non-invasive ventilation. These are some um, types of non-invasive ventilation. Okay, that fella down there, let's see if I can hit it. This guy right here, iron lung. This was not in 1950, people. This was in 2014. He lives in Texas. He was one of 10 people in the whole entire world that was recorded at the time that was using an iron lung. I want to know, how did they transport him there? I want to see that. Then um, we have negative pressure. I used negative pressure back in the 90s with many of my patients. The chest carass, the gentleman that was talking about it yesterday, I was like, yep, I remember that. We even had somebody on a rocking bed. I didn't include that because you don't see those anymore at all, rocking beds. Um, but anyway, this is a HIAC biphasic ventilator. And how about, um, you ever think of that with diaphragmatic pacing as a ventilator? Many people don't think of that as ventilation, but lots of people get weaned off that um, can using diaphragmatic pacers. Um, Non-invasive ventilation more traditionally, this is what we're looking at. If you have someone that's on ventilation for over 12 hours a day, I hope you're using more than one interface. Dr. Hess talked about that yesterday. Two interfaces, why skin breakdown? And who is at fault? Sorry to tell you this, but it's the respiratory therapist. So we need to make sure we're doing the right things. Ventilator selection. We need to make sure that we're picking the right ventilator. They are my sponsor today. This is Breos. Again, they have a booth over there. Um, it's very small. Lots of our pediatric patients, um, parents like to use it because they can just fling it over their shoulder if they have to, throw it in the kid cart, um, whatever they need to. You need to make sure you got good mobility, battery life, needs to be good and there's a lot of ventilators out there with all kinds of battery lives everything from seven and a half hours to 15 hours of battery life and more um, versatility i think that more clinician than user but how are we going to improve someone's quality of life making sure that we are using the right um, system for them the right ventilator with the right type of ventilation. Okay? Sometimes we have people start out on volume ventilation still because they're not familiar with all the versatility that we have now and we'll have a doctor that'll order volume ventilation for a patient to go home on but yet they're using something like targeted tidal volume in the hospital. It's like why are you doing that? Well I didn't know you could do that. So that, who's home care here? We're the experts. You have to tell them what we can do. Did I say that enough? We're the experts. <laughs> One more time. Okay. Invasive, non-invasive, high flow in some of the ventilators, telehealth. We've talked about it over and over again. We actually started using telehealth um, in my company, of course, in the pandemic. Lots of people were like, do not come to my house. We have serviced over 600 patients on ventilators in Colorado and Wyoming. And they were like, no, don't come to my house. How can we make this work? So we did a lot of FaceTime. Um, at that time, guys, this was what, three years ago? How many ventilators did we have that actually had cloud data collection? One that I remember of. But what we did is we had them send their SD cards or some of the ventilators needed a jump drive and we'd send them that, they'd download it and send it back to us and we'd have all our data there 
and then we do our visit um, via telehealth. I just found a really neat, neat um, device. It's a digital uh, stethoscope that's only like 150 bucks. The other one I saw was like 600 bucks. It's like, I'm not sending that to anybody. <laughs> but uh, a digital stethoscope, they, they can record it on their phone and then send it to you, their breath sounds. Isn't that cool? Has anybody seen it? It's really cool, really cool. So that's another tool that we can use for telehealth or telerespiratory. Um, ease of use. I, don't, I think ease of use for end user, yes, but also clinicians because then we can teach them because it's easier to use, right? What are the challenges getting these people home? Now this is um, kind of a focus on people who are in facilities. Okay. We get people out of clinics all the time, and we can pretty much turn them around in a couple of days and get them set up. But the education, 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 continually, right? So that they understand. We have actually made a whole entire book on everything from washing to your hands to changing a trach, and specific to each ventilator that we use. Um, that we give for education, and we start with that. Here's your materials, and now here's your homework, okay? Let's make sure we're educating them and their nurses. They're anybody who is caring for them has to have education. They also have to be committed to care. Why would I say that? Isn't everybody who takes their loved one home committed to care? Huh. They think they're going to do it. Um, lots of people go, oh, yeah, I can do this 24-7 by myself. No, we, we require at least two caregivers, at least. Okay? So you've got to make sure there's commitment. Payers and financial resources. Okay, here's another shout-out. We have had non-invasive ventilation denied from insurance companies for even ALS patients. Please, please, please let your Congress people know, let your senators know what's happening. Um, it, there's a lots of articles coming out now. I'm working with AA Home Care and the ALS Association so that we can get the word out. We're trying to get it um, publicized. So um, we're working on that right now. We've got patients that are flat out being denied or changing insurances and then they have um, denied the ventilator even though they've been on it for literally years they don't need it because they changed insurances so let's get on that bandwagon it is immoral it is unethical for them to do that to people who actually need the ventilation when you said that yesterday about uh, Dr. Hess, when you said we should send these people home if they're in the hospital on NIV, um, I know. I was just like, he's right. They just cringe to hear that. But why? Why? We're the best country on earth. <laughs> we should treat our people better. Okay, I'm getting off on my getting off my soapbox here. Okay. Lots of challenges. Um, this is my favorite part. These are people that have been on mechanical ventilation. This happens to be Mark. He was injured in, at the age of 16 in 1997. I met him at Craig Hospital. He is a tetraplegia. He um, graduated from high school. He went on to college. He studied engineering and political science. He got a political science degree in 2005. He went on to UCLA and graduated in 2008 um, with a law degree. Uh, 2016, that's his little baby girl. Him and his wife had a baby girl in 2016. He is a practicing attorney. He has um, what he calls his most notable case. He got a victory against the city of LA 
requiring them to spend over $1.3 billion to um, make sure that there are ramps, curb ramps. And they have to do that over a 30-year period to make them ADA compliant. I think that's quite a success. Um, he said, uh, let's see, don't ever take no for an answer. Make sure that you are living to your fullest ca capabilities, even if you have a spinal cord injury. He said, if I can do it, anybody can do it. This is Asher. This is one of our um, little clients. Asher um, was born in 2017. He actually was diagnosed in utero with a congenital heart defect. And um, he lived in Wyoming. Well, his mother lived in Wyoming at the time when the diagnosis came down. So she came to Denver the month before he was due so that she could be close to the specialists. Um, after he was born, she said all my worries were, went away because in two weeks he went home with nothing, not even oxygen, nothing. He went home, did great for about four months. And then he got an infection and um, it took a toll on his heart and his organs. He had a 36 hour heart um, surgery in 2018, about six months of uh, age. And it was 36 hours, yeah. So isn't this, this is my favorite picture. Um, <laughs> so after that, he was uh, intubated, ventilated 24 seven. Um, he had his last heart surgery in February 2019, and they decided in April of 2019 to, for him to go home. They couldn't get him wean, so he was going to have to be trached, which they did. Um, and then we met him, sent, met um, Asher and his mom, and um, he went home. He did so well. He just turned around as soon as they put him on a home vent, and that little guy wanted to go home. That's what I said. He was ready to go home. In about a four months period of time, he made up for all, because he was in the hospital for almost a year, and he made up for all his de developmental um, delays in three to four months. Um, even though he's still trached and vented, that uh, and also has a feeding tube. All that stuff is just an extension of him. He doesn't even bother him. He just goes. This kid just goes. He learned how to crawl out of his crib, so we started calling him Spider-Man. Um, but he, he just takes that vent everywhere with him. And in his basket, you know, he have baskets on those vent stands. Oh no, we don't use that for anything medical. It's juice boxes, snacks, and toys. That is what that is for. Did you not know? This is Christine. Christine um, moved to Colorado in 2005 on the advice of a hospice patient that she was helping to plan for her next point of care. Christine, you see, is a nurse discharge planner. She was diagnosed with ALS in 2019. She knew what kind of hurdles and struggles were to come. She had to be her own advocate, which she was. She, um, when she found herself fatigued, lethargic, and having headaches meant much of the day, she went to the physician and said, I need a ventilator. And she didn't stop until they you know, got all her diagnostic testing and got her a ventilator. She even shopped around for, I, I would say, the best um, respiratory home medical equipment company because she picked us. <laughs> you see here where it says Mount Albert? 14,433 feet, that is the highest point in Colorado. And her and her husband, this was after she was ventilated people, went on a hike and went up 
to the tip top. Isn't that awesome? So Christine has some words for us. She says she's not done living yet. She need you need to, or she has a home RT that she can trust. She you need to take advantage of every opportunity. She says I feel like I live more than now than ever before, and I think that's an awesome statement. She said it's important to have an HME company that is responsive. We're going to skip this one. This is Clint. Clint did ski to defeat ALS. Do you guys have that here? <laughs> I'm kidding. Because, you know, we have all the mountains. You guys have mountains, but we have big mountains. I live at 6,500 feet. So, and that's on our flatlands. <laughs> so, um, yes, and I love your mountains. They are beautiful. Um, okay, this is Clint. Uh, he said that he actually ignored a lot of small symptoms that he was having. Um, in, in, in 2014, he was playing in a competitive hockey league. And this is his quote. When someone took the puck off my stick, he says, I'm Canadian. He actually is up in Colorado too. But he says, I'm Canadian and no one steals the puck from me. And um, he said that then he started going to see some physicians to see what was really going on. The other, time, the other stuff he could just ignore, but don't steal the puck, okay? Um, he also loved to ski. He was diagnosed um, with ALS. He couldn't hold his poles anymore, but he went skiing anyway. He said it terrified his family, but he says he couldn't give up the thrill he loved it. He said he was really sad because he thought he'd never be able to ski again once he had his trach. And he and his son loved to go skiing. And then they had this ski to defeat ALS in Colorado. And um, I don't know if he talked people into it, but he roped us into helping him do stuff, which was not a hard thing. It was like, you want to do that? I'm going to help you. It was so fun. I helped actually somebody... Um, jump out of an airplane that was 24 hour ventilated. I, I like to do that kind of crazy stuff for people. Um, <laughs> yeah, my attorney was like, what are you doing? You can't do that, you can't let them do that. I said, well, they're gonna do it whether I help them or not, and I wanna help them. So yeah, yeah that was crazy. Anyway, back to Clint. Um, Clint said he was really nervous when he got to the slopes because he was the only one there that couldn't hold his head up and that had a ventilator and oxygen. But he said once he got on those slopes with his son, that was all over. He was so thrilled and excited to be able to be on the slopes with his kid again. His kid's name's Jack. He said the favorite part of his day was definitely skiing fast with my son. He wanted to leave us with some words as well. Stay independent as long as you can. Keep laughing and learn to celebrate the small victories. So, health-related quality of life is more important than even the prospect of life expectancy. And how can I say that? Is because there was a study done with 4,518 hemodialysis patients, and they rated health-related quality of life as 92% and life expectancy 80%. Eh. But I want to have a good life, whatever it is, right? I actually told my doctor once, this was before I was even 50, I said, I want to live to be 100. And he looked at me and he said, 100? And I said, yes, but it has to be a good 100. Okay. Health-related quality of life is becoming more reliable to study because the questionnaires are now more refined. But we have to always remember it's subjective by nature. It's what people feel. And I think it needs to be shorter. I don't know if you guys ever took a survey, but they take a long time. One theme in many of these studies said select correct support 
at home, whether it's a physician who knows what they're doing, whether it is a nursing agency, your home medical equipment company with skilled respiratory therapists. And remember, health-related quality of life is just not about health. It's their overall well-being, mind and body. And health-related quality of life has a relationship with proper ventilator management. And why do I say that? And yes, it was one study that I showed, but there are many others out there that talks about proper ventilator management. So if you've got somebody at home and they are not having um, proper ventilator management, their life is not going to be fun for them, okay? And what do we want to do is we want to give quality of life at the highest point for them. So make sure that we're taking care of patients at home. For all you home respiratory therapists, you are the expert at home, okay? We even have patients that say, oh, I'm afraid to go to the hospital because they don't know how to run my ventilator. So what do we do? We go in and we help the RTs at the hospital. If they're not going to be on a hospital ventilator and they're going to be on their own ventilator, let's help them. We are the expert. Be the expert. Wherever you're at in care, be the expert. And I said, that I heard three minutes. What kind of questions might you have? Question. And what oh. is it, Jason? What is the size of the smallest? Whoa! Large. <laughs> what, what, what is, is the, the size? size? Of? What is the size of the smallest portable ventilator in the name? What oh. is the size of the smallest portable ventilator in the name? Well, I know that um, they have. They have one that they call, um, you know, that fits on your belt. It's a Life 2000. However, there is a however. You have to have um, a 50 PSI source for it. So you've got to carry around a tank. Um, but really just the ventilator, all encapsulated. And doesn't have a lot of versatility either. But, okay. It's it, one, yeah, I'm sorry. It's one pound. But oh, one pound. there's okay. not a lot of versatility with it. Um, and with the Brios ventilator, it weighs about six pounds. Okay. And it's about the, about the size of a um, sheet of paper. Okay, great. Great, thank you.